welcome to the uh, beautiful and amazing DevRel AMA. It's been a while, huh? How have you been? It has been a few weeks. And uh, yeah, good. Good. Got obviously got like a nice little announcement about the team that we can make in a few minutes when people are here as well. So that's obviously really nice. Yeah. Very exciting. Start of summer, start of festival season. I was in Prague on Monday for the Web3 Print Summit, which was wonderful. Very good crowd. Mm. So, oh, good. Good crowd? Who was there? That was, I mean, those kind of the, the regulars that we'd expect project wise. And then, so I'm going to take off my flip flops. There's a massive storm here, so I just had to run around shutting all the windows in my apartment because all this rain started coming in. Uh, <laughs> I'll take them off so we don't have those annoying squeaks in the background. Yeah, obviously, kind of people from DarkFi, Monero, Cosmos, Privacy Communities. And then we had a couple of other very good people speaking. Dr. Nick, who, if people don't follow him on Twitter, he is uh, mostly focused about DAOs and privacy. Definitely one of like, the more based Twitter feeds around. And then Amin as well, who was talking about Tornado Cash and his you know, the Privacy Pools project as well. And this uh, interesting interplay between regulation and actually building privacy projects that everyone is suddenly having to brush up on <laughs> become aware of. And loads of others as well. I was on a panel with a guy from Secret Network, mm. which was very good, talking about maintaining privacy infrastructure. And let's not forget to mention that I believe it was organized by our dear Mikola. Mikola Suisko, our... He was one of, the, one of the three, I think, main organizers of the event. It was fantastic. And then there was Trees and someone else whose pseudonym I have forgotten. So apologies for that. Mm. I also have an announcement for you, Max. I don't know if you caught it on, uh, on the channels, but we today actually finally launched our Delegators program. And I believe a, a large, large chunk of our audience actually today is from the Delegators program. Oh, cool. Very cool. I did not catch that. So yeah, that is nice. See, it's nice that we can all learn on the DevRel AMAs. <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean, just you know, having joined the, de uh, the, uh, the Delegators program does not mean that these people are new. Most of them are actually OGs. That's one of the things that I had to... Uh, so we had a lot of great submissions. I had to uh, make some hard decisions. And when I had to do that, I always, uh, I always consider it community age. So uh, most of the people who you see here are OGs who have been around you know, and have been frequenting these AMAs and also community calls. Very cool. I think we should... Should we get started? Yeah. I don't know whether more people are coming. Yeah, let's get started. They can trickle in. Yeah. What do you want to start with? Uh, I think uh, an overview of, uh, of um, frequent or like uh, recent releases would be great. Yeah. Okay, cool. The release cycle has slightly slowed down, you know, in the last, last kind of like month or so. I mean, that's one of the reasons that we kind of like moved this to last week, right? Because we, we didn't have a release last week. And partially that's just because of the wonder that is May and June and uh, bank holidays in European countries, isn't it? Like there's basically one a week for like, you know, kind of at least half the team. So that's, that's partially why. And then partially as well, you know, we're also, we have... On the level of the MixNet infrastructure itself, and this is kind of something I wanted to bring up in a more general sense anyway, because I think for a while we've kind of been talking about development efforts as if in this kind of like really monolithic way, right? Like across the board, which is something that's kind of a hangover from the testnet. You know, like the testnets, we had the MixNet infrastructure, and that was kind of what we had. But now, obviously, we have the SDKs. NimConnect is kind of becoming more of a more of its own kind of standalone app. You know, we have stuff with Android with that now. You know, so it's kind of branching out in terms of the development. We're kind of branching from just all kind of focusing on this one single thing to more of a infrastructure and dev tools and product split as well. So that's just kind of a one, you know, one thing that I kind of wanted to bring up too is that I don't know, when we're talking about this kind of stuff, then actually dev efforts can be split, you know, a lot across uh, into different kind of buckets. A lot of the work recently has been on getting a couple of big things ready on more on the infrastructure side, more on the directly on the mixnet side, but that's actually through smart contracts. So there's two smart contracts that have been being worked on. These are the, the NIM DNS, you could call it. So it's kind of no longer will you have to rely on those like really big, <laughs> horrible to try and recognize alphanumeric strings, which are your client address. Then you know we're, there is a John has been working on both of these smart contracts actually, yeah, like a NIM DNS thing, so you can kind of you know create some kind of a record 
which can be used as an address within NIM, within the, you know, the ecosystem of the MixNet and clients. And the other one has been the long-awaited service provider directory contract, which the very earliest sketch of I actually worked on like a months ago. This is basically all of the functionality to have in a smart contract, much in the same way as you do with the MixNet, you have mix nodes and gateways that are in the smart contract, right? That's where the topology is served from, even though you actually at the moment grab it from the API of a validator. You know, the validator gets it from there, that just holds it as a cache, so we're not constantly hitting the chain. Yeah, that's where node information is stored, right? That's kind of one of the points of using a blockchain is that we can have this directory that previously in other, in other overlay networks like Tor are instead on, you know, servers and all of the attendant kind of security and denial of service attack vectors that that opens up. So yeah, what this basically means is you will soon be able to, from the wallet, if you want to announce a service provider, basically do that from your wallet in the same way that you do with a mix node and a gateway. It sounds deceptively simple. They're like, oh, you just work on some smart contracts and you deploy them. But because we have to interact with them via either, you know, from a GUI, which is via the wallet, so that has to go, that's like another set of features that have to go in the wallet. And then also, if you want to do it by the CLI, we also have to update the NIM CLI tool as well, right? So there's quite a lot of uh, introducing new kind of core MixNet functionality like this. It touches a lot of different places. So a lot of that has been going on. And, you know, all of the attending kind of testing and reviewing and all of that kind of stuff. Alongside that, a couple of people have been working on uh, a new packet format, which is very exciting. Again, this is not, you know, this isn't, uh, this is kind of so deep in the mix net that it's, you know, we haven't necessarily been like making, bringing too much attention on it because it touches so much stuff and it's a longer development process. But that's been going on. Then I can't remember which release we had the last time I was doing one of these. I think it was 19 or was it 18? Can you remember? <laughs> oh, I, I can't remember. It, it was a while back. If it wasn't 18, if we didn't touch on 18 as well, since we've done one of these, we, you know, we haven't done one in a while. Then what we also had was a heartbeat message implemented between the Softify proxy and the network requester which is basically a UAP kind of message before you try and connect to it. And if you can't connect to it, then an error is passed back down the pipe, which then can be rendered on some, either in the CLI or, you know, in the case of something like NIM Connect on a GUI, right? So then you actually have, we, one of the things that we are having to kind of think about at the moment is a lot of this, um, you know, this kind of stability stuff that we're finding is a problem you know, with stuff like NimConnect, being able to quickly and properly tell if a connection could actually go through or not and all of this kind of stuff. Then also a bit of kind of just error, bug kind of fixing as well. So there is work going on at the moment to do some bug fixing for the stuff like the update command and um, a couple of other bits and bobs. Uh, and also the, re the uh, auto-refreshing lists on the network requester. But um, that's kind of what's been going out of this release. And we've also had some, you know, kind of updates to them connect to in terms of the um, implementing this heartbeat between the Sox5 proxy and a network requester that you're trying to ping. Overall, that's about it. This is, a lot of this is ongoing work, right? So we also have, there is ongoing work at the moment going into the SDK, the TypeScript SDK. Um, there's still coconut work going on as well. Getting this to be actually kind of implementable is a very long road. And there's some work to be done on the validators themselves before we can do this. So what I'm basically saying is there's, there's a couple of quite deep threads going on at the moment that will go on for a while. So it's not kind of immediate week by week features, but um, more at some point, a load of stuff will kind of seem to happen incredibly quickly, but it's actually been being worked on for a good amount of time by this point. Soon TM, yeah. is it not? About it. I'm not even going to promise that anymore. I'm just going to say it will happen <laughs> when it happens. A more organic mycelial fashion all right yeah <laughs> that actually makes sense i agree rather than continuing to promise uh, an abstract amount of time i mean soon tm i think is a good good measure of time it's very exact and very um you know we, it, it's a good promise because it's numberified yeah basically yeah it's like atomic time it's uh, exactly <laughs> exactly just a wider point as well that i'd kind of like to make it's like the um one of the things that's like coming up with all of these like quite long-term you know, development threads, uh, Coconut being a great example of this, is that actually, you know, we have a very complex system. The complexity is partially because we're trying to make it like as stable as possible as well. What this means 
is that implementing certain things uh, like coconut, right? Even if you have DKG implemented, distributed key generation implemented, you have, you know, the actual pull of the, you know, the, the ZK and all of the attendant stuff behind the credential itself, you know, even starting to integrate that into the code base is quite an intense prospect because it touches so many things because it's such a deeply interconnected bit of infrastructure that we can then pour into. So yeah, just a, a point to make. Will people be able to stake Nix tokens as well on, on validators, just like they can NIM tokens on, on Mix? You know, Nix is the token of the chain. All of the normal Cosmos SDK validator stuff, like any other Cosmos SDK chain, you'll be able to um, partake in those activities. Makes sense. All right, so next up, uh, Super Maya is asking uh, whether we can tell, uh, tell them more about the new packet format, which we mentioned a couple of times on these DevRel AMAs already. So what, what are the benefits? You know, Why would we uh, change from Sphix to this new format? Maybe what are the challenges? Yeah, so the goal behind that is just optimization. We obviously like having one of the harder selling points of, of something like a mixnet, right, is um, that additional latency that you get in virtue of the fact that you, know, you are bouncing packets through multiple hops instead of just sending a request to a server, for instance. Uh, the main point behind it is just that the Sphinx packet format is very useful, but we could optimize it in some ways. And so Outfox is basically like a, um, a more optimized packet format. So we just increase overall like speed, we reduce, we reduce latency throughout the mixnet. On the actual packet level itself, I couldn't tell you that much yet. Unfortunately, I would have to kind of read up on that. I, uh, like I said, the validators have been kind of taking up uh, the majority of my uh, headspace recently. So um, yeah, I would have to dive into Outbox a bit more. But those are the justifications behind it anyway. Just for context, folks. So as you may have noticed from our communications uh, lately, we've, we've uh, started talking about more, uh, talking more and more about mass adoption. Obviously, the project is in that stage. And then there are these few things that float around in the in the core team right now, getting ready for that. And one of those is the speeding up the mixnet project, which is something that not a bad thing to have when people are using the network for everyday use. Obviously, there is a necessary trade off in, in latency, but we got to make sure that. The mix it overall is as fast as possible. And I guess this new packet format is um, to contribute to that. Exactly. Also very timely question also from Nick. It just recently came up again that we're going to look into the uh, the routing score drop when people update their nodes. Yeah. Is there any update on this front? No, there's no update on this front quite yet. It's known as an issue, you know, I think from the different threads I've been kind of explaining at the moment, these are all like uh, quite big things that people have been, that the dev team has split across. So, but we do, they are aware it's a problem. We have no update yet, unfortunately. But it is being looked into. So, um, um, yeah. so there are some other priorities, but it is something that we, we are aware of and, um, and are looking into. That's simple to solve. Amorph is asking a related question. So mixed node uptime question, which is why in the mixed node binaries do not have auto update mechanism for mixed node process. Auto updating is kind of, uh, I mean, it's kind of an interesting thing. I think people can have, there's different opinions that you can take on auto updating, right? Because on the one hand, Yes, I think auto updating would be, you know, it's obviously very useful rather than you having to either compile or download a pair of binaries again, or like a binary again, and then, you know, pause your process, swap it out, restart your process. On that hand, it would be very useful. On the other hand, then it has, you know, it's come up in conversations before and people have also brought up the point that having some kind of auto updater, essentially a thing that basically will grab and download a binary for you remotely is maybe something that people also don't like from kind of a security perspective. So there's pros and cons for each one. Uh, maybe kind of a, an additional like opt-in option or something like that could be good. I did see that the Notris Verify crew did share their Ansible scripts, I believe they are, for their updating. Maybe that, for the meanwhile, maybe that's a, um, a good middle ground that you could look into. Yes, and also uh, Delegators Program participants, stay tuned because we have Palmflake on the team as well, who has his own script for updating, also even migrating nodes and even setting up nodes, which is like a, almost a one-click uh, process. Uh, so yeah, there's quite a few solutions to this. Yeah, so distribution of the NIC, uh, of the NIC token, no dump node, there's no info on that yet. So we're going to be releasing that as soon as it becomes available. Yep. Uh, also initial APYs. Uh, do you know anything about that, Max? That's also too early to say, right? No, but I mean, again, like the kind of APYs, all of this kind of stuff will be set by the validators themselves in the same way that most chains do it. This is not like a necessarily like a Nix specific thing. 
It's in the same way that you have a distribution of, you know, kind of delegator yield percentages in other personal SDK chains as well. Uh, from what I remember, though, then, yeah, it's kind of validated by validator, basically. They can set their own. Ah, okay. The next question is from Murluki. She's asking whether we can calculate the exact latency of, of traffic when it goes through the mixnet. I'm not sure whether it's, uh, you know, traffic in general on the mixnet, like how much the overall latency is the mixnet or when I'm, I'm sending my own packets to see the latency of those. Presumably the latter, not the former. I, considering that, um, let me just have a think about this actually, because it, it's kind of, well, it's kind of an interesting question, right? It's kind of like one of the things that came up in the, in the, like the panel that I did on Monday. It's like the uh, the actual like limitations of building a <laughs> piece of privacy infrastructure, because yeah, stuff like gathering metrics for the whole network is actually like a quite a weird difficulty, because by design uh, you're kind of doing stuff that may that like a very limited set of people have access to limited things, right? Yeah, kind of like with the node testing, like the way that node testing works right now is seems quite complicated, but then it's kind of had to be complicated because of the nature of the mixnet. You know, you have to kind of construct a few paths with that mix node in it uh, at different hops to be able to then kind of average out what's going on with it, right? Uh, there is no option right now to just be able to like send a load of packets to just a single node. Um, but that is going to be coming soon, which is quite cool. So a test my node feature is um, the, the structure for that is being put in place, which is quite cool. So, yeah, I think basically you would only really be able to test nodes that you controlled, I imagine. However, and then probably, you know, if you were kind of like, if loads of people then kind of uh, shared their metrics, maybe we could start averaging it out. But I don't think live, you know, there's kind of a way of uh, doing this. In a, in, you know, if you were kind of imagining it more from like a dashboard, like a live dashboard kind of situation. Hmm. The next question is interesting, I think, to both of us. So for context, the... Um... Uh, delegators program just just launched today, and um, as requested by both the mentors of the delegators program, which are Wunderbear, Hermes Staking, and, and Service Marine, aka mm -hmm. uh, CGI from from Lutras Verify, asked to have the space to discuss things with participants on Element instead of Discord or Telegram. And of course, you know I agreed with them. So the next next question is, why did we choose Element yep. for that space instead of Discord? And I guess you also you you the main proponent of moving over to to Element. Some thoughts about that. It's kind of, I mean, at least for me, it's a personal preference thing to use uh, something like Element that's like an instance, of, like a matrix instance that we control and is just like more private than something like Discord, right? So partially it's just that. I think as a privacy project, we should be dog fooding and using privacy technologies and as much as we do. You know, I think like that, and that's, that's kind of like a, a philosophical point in a way. In another way, it's also... Just I hang out in Element more <laughs> as well. So actually, like uh, having internal and external kind of like channels next to each other, it's just like a far more pleasant experience, as well as the uh, the privacy implications of using Element over Discord. Also, don't ever forget that Discord at any point could just shut your channel down. <laughs> it could just shut your Discord server down, and um, then you've lost everything. You've lost all of those communications and chats and people and all, all of that. Whereas that can't happen to us with Element because we run our own instance and we have backups and we're not going to tank our own <laughs> server. I think the uh, calling different Discord whatever servers is uh, a clever piece of wording, I think, to maybe make people think it was more independent or autonomous than it actually is. Exactly. You can run Element through the mixnet as well because we added the endpoints to network requesters. You can actually, from the CLI, you can run Element Desktop through the mixnet as well. That's pretty dope. Which again goes back to the whole dope. Mm -hmm. I was saying. When Element in, uh, in NimConnect then? Yeah, well, we're, I, uh, I kind of just did it because I wanted to use Element through the mixnet. <laughs> but, um, but again, this kind of goes back to, you know, a lot of stuff suddenly happening that I was saying before, right? Because actually when we get the, all of the service provider directory stuff up and running and deployed and you know being used then actually it doesn't it's less arduous as a thing because then it's not necessarily like you might be having to add something to the gui of nimconnect maybe 
but we could also rework and connect to maybe uh, just grab the network requesters from the smart contract, which means that if someone, say, me, uh, imagining I'm a community member, or, you know, think, oh, cool, I want to actually put up a smart contract, uh, put up a service provider that can support, you know, whatever, simplex, right? If we are in a situation where NimConnect just grabs the list of like supposedly supported providers from the smart contract, then there is no delay in maybe it being supported, you know, something like this. So yeah, I think it's kind of this, because those threads of work are happening as well, then maybe adding matrix and NimConnect right now, maybe just before we publish those, isn't necessarily like the best use of the time that we have to split across, you know, a lot of different things right now. Sorry, that was a very long-winded answer. <laughs> that makes total sense. The, the only thing that I would add is a bit more from the community perspective. So there's this conundrum when it comes to community. If you want to reach a lot of people, th this came up on, uh, on Dev Really Amazing Community Calls before too. So if you want to reach a lot of people in the crypto space or basically anywhere, you have to be on these platforms that are platforms, just like Discord and Telegram. But w w we try to be very... so. The decision, the strategic decision on NIMS part was that we're going to be present on these platforms to reach as many people as we can, because that ultimately will contribute to privacy for everyone, because if people know about the project and people will use it. But then it's a bit of a schizophrenic scenario because these platforms, especially Discord, Telegram is maybe, maybe a bit better than Discord, but Discord is uniquely terrible with privacy. And as Max mentioned, it's all on the Discord servers. Like everything you do here can be deleted tomorrow while, you know, our element server is our server so it's running locally with self-hosted uh, so it's uh, it's also a, like a measure of resiliency what will increasingly start to happen when it comes to community is that we of course will uh, still be present on telegram and discord but we will start treating that more like a town square if you run into nim people on the town square you can talk about stuff uh, there but you know if you want to come into the nim office you know and be a bit closer to the core team and discuss you know some stuff that maybe is not town square topic then you can come over to element and hang out there so uh, our element presence were, uh, will increase as time goes by because it's much closer to the actual vision of you know uh, of, of a platform or, or place where we should hang out as uh, as people who care about privacy rather than discord which like i said is uniquely terrible for your privacy mm -hmm. whether it's possible to know which packet is the most used in order to know which anonymity set you're in yeah, am I correct in reading this as you thinking that there will be like two packet formats, like Alfox and Sphinx? Because that's not the plan. The plan will be to, to switch to uh, the more optimized one. The In terms of like packets being sent, then you will, there will still be that single, singular anonymity set, basically. You don't have to worry about that. If that is me reading your question correctly, serves. So let me know if it's not. It was more packet size. There is no like hard plan right now to also have like multiple to have multiple packet sizes be used by the default again because that would kind of like kind of start messing with the stuff like yeah making different anonymity sets when you were doing if someone was observing all the traffic. So right now the multiple packet sizes that are in the config is like a possible thing. These are really in there so they can be used by people who are researching, uh, looking at if there are better or worse packet sizes for the entire network to use. I almost view those as kind of like a developer or research options, but there's no plan right now to have it where you would have to like pick a packet size out of like a couple of options because yeah, that would split the anonymity set of packets in the network, which we obviously don't want to do. We skipped the question and I think it's an important one. Ready? Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, as a developer, what's the best way that one can contribute to building them products? Yeah, so this actually brings up some fun info that we actually didn't mention at the beginning, which is that as of yesterday, or kind of today, then I am being joined by one new member of Devro, who you will all meet at the next Devro AMA, and there will soon be a second person joining me in Devro as well. So he's not here today, but you will maybe start to see him around in community channels. Uh, Serinko is joining us. Uh, he has joined us already. So he's kind of starting this week and we will introduce him at the next one, like I said. And then, yeah, we will have another person. Why is this important? Apart from just being nice news, why is this important to that question? 
as to how you can contribute to the building of DIM products, well, soon the, the grants will be starting back up. And uh, so that would be one way the, uh, the kind of grants process will get. We had a first, you know, small test, but obviously me doing it on my own, I can't also do the, all the other things I'm doing and the grant program. But yeah, we will hopefully launch in a more like rolling kind of grants program, at least for smaller ones. So that would be uh, one way to start contributing to the building. You know, that could also be for maybe could also be for features for existing products. So if you maybe wanted to add a feature to Nim Connect or the wallet or something like this, then, you know, doing that via a brand could also be a possibility. Or you could just build your own stuff as well. That's amazing. I actually added to my notes that we, uh, we left out the announcement of, uh, or like foreshadowing of uh, Serenco. So guys, stay tuned. Next Devrel AMA, we're joined by at least one other person. When is the other person, uh, the second person joining us? It's more like end of the month, probably mid-July, depending on how the bi-weekly, the fortnightly um, AMA is for. Mm. I'm happy for you, man. So you, you'll get to do the work of only three people, maybe from now on, and not, not like seven. That's, uh, that's great news. Oh yeah, no, it's great. No, like the, the bonus of this now is we can, another thing, everyone can actually expect tutorials to start happening again because I will actually have time to write them. <laughs> so yeah, the, the, I'm currently working on a thing for the Rust SDK and, you know, TypeScript SDK, all of this kind of stuff will, will kind of come soon. Obviously with the Rust SDK, there's, you know, a couple of different options of what you can do there as well because there's also the Sox5 client, which is kind of exposed if people would like to see particular things as a tutorial of maybe, you know, maybe how you send a transaction, how you kind of build a service provider that, you know, sends a transaction to a blockchain for you, something like this, then, um, yeah, just drop a message in the dev channel of Element because I am also planning to write up the Cosmos SDK service provider and how you would kind of create and sign offline messages and then pipe it through the mixnet and have a service provider broadcast it. That's another thing that I need to write up, which is a demo I did in Barcelona a few months ago now. So yeah, expect the speed of DevRel stuff to also massively speed up, which is cool. Super exciting. Yeah, can't wait for that. Uh, by the way, guys, I shared a link in the chat to our element space. So join it, get to hang out with us there, which I think it's uh, is a present in and of itself, I guess. Right? Yeah. Next question is, and I think it's, it's, it's actually a really good one. I've been wondering about this uh, uh, myself as well. So no dump Noda is asking whether uh, the requirements of, of uh, running a mix or like requirements of a node, mm -hmm. hardware requirements will change when we want to speed up the mix net just to become more like a VPN. It's a difficult question to answer because we have been doing this optimization work on the mix net with stuff like the packet format. We're also looking at a couple of other things which are being researched at the moment, which I can't necessarily quite mention. Because of this, then we haven't really done any kind of hard and fast what would be the most you know optimized hardware setup for a mix node. We haven't really dug into that too much yet because we have this other work that's happening. For the moment, that's quite a difficult question to answer in that way. Anyway, right? Like partially, it shouldn't change too much is what I will provisionally say. And that's partially because, you know, these packet format upgrades are giving us like pretty chunky upgrades. And there are some other things that are being looked into it, like right now, which are actually more at the protocol level, which, which is also, you know, that one part of that research is the kind of this parameterization, this tuning of the mixnet that, that's, that's uh, you know, that's being worked on as well. It will more probably be, we will come out with hard and fast kind of hardware requirements after we've done that. Once it's kind of, once the mixnet is kind of in, a, in an optimized, somewhat parameterizable state, then from there, we'll probably be able to say, give more kind of proper information. Bit of a soon TM kind of answer. Sorry for that. We will never get away from soon TM. It really is a trademark of, uh, of DevRel AMAs. Not if you do anything with active development, which is exactly what we're talking about. So no. <laughs> yeah, embrace it, Max. It's, it's good. People like it. You can vote in the chat whether you like soon TM, but I, I would assume everybody absolutely loves it. So don't worry about it. Yeah. Next question, I think, is for me. When Harry's pinup poster, did you hear about that, Max? No, I didn't. So a, a quick summary. <laughs> One of the things that came out from the, from the su recent surveys that we conducted, and once again, huge thanks for everybody who participated, was that uh, what would you like to see more from them? To that question, someone answered a uh, Harry pinup poster. So we committed to that uh, very officially, and it's coming at some point. Soon TM is, is what I can give you. I did ask uh, Pablo, our beautiful designer, for a timeline for that. He gave me one, but 
promised me not to share it publicly because he doesn't want to commit to it. There's a lot going on on the design front right now. So there's also a major redesign of our uh, website happening, and he's busy with that. So it is coming soon, DM, but it is coming. Keep your eyes on our channels. Mm -hmm. The Harry Pinup poster is coming. Mm -hmm. Are you going to put it on your wall, Max? Uh, yeah, for sure. That'll go in my, that'll go in my office. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. I'll be the first one, first one in line to, to make the purchase. Keep the question from, from SMP. I don't particularly understand the question, but um, it may be a, an interesting one. Did someone else notice in the logs of the network requester that some IPv6 addresses are mentioned, but are not posted in the unknown list using Telegram? As in the, they're mentioned as being blocked and then they're not added to the unknown list? Is this what you mean? Uh, I think so. Because if so, well, then if so, yeah, that's a, uh, something's not. Something's going a bit wrong somewhere then, if that's happening. Whack in an issue on GitHub. Just throw an, throw an issue in. Any unknown address, whether it's a domain name or just, you know, an IP address or an IPv6 address, rather, should, uh, if, it's, if it's being blocked, it should be added to the unknown list. So maybe something is not quite working as expected there. And then tag me in it on a channel. That sounds good. Ideally an element because I will probably miss it uh, less. <laughs> you know, element is like, I don't miss stuff in element as much as I do in Discord. Gentle shilling, actually, for element. Nice. Well, Gentle nudging. I... Oh no, I think it's disappeared now. There was a question I saw about licensing of open source code, but it seems to have disappeared. I'm not sure it's gone. I think the, the escort deleted it probably. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a general point to be made. If you don't want something to be, you know, some licenses do have the legal requirement, uh, GPL, uh, GPLv3, for instance, which is the kind of hardcore free as in freedom. You can actually buy a great t-shirt from the, I think it's the Free Software Foundation's website with GPL, GPLv3, uh, free as in freedom, written on it in amazing font, just as a, a, a merch feel. You know, some licenses like that, then actually it's a legal requirement that even though the code is, the, the code is open source and any project that then uses that code remains open source, right, as a legal requirement. Um, so there are some licenses that kind of deal with this problem of, you're open source and you're kind of, you know, you could be building something that would be used by someone else, right, in a closed source way. However, the reason to build in the open, which is a general point when it comes, especially when it comes to privacy and it comes to the security of things as well, is that if open source code is open source, then it means that anyone can have a look at it, anyone can find a problem in it, and then they can immediately tell basically everyone who, uh, is interested in that piece of software, hey, there's a problem in this. So, you know, keeping kind of security through our obscurity of being like, okay, well, we just won't show anyone our code and just expose an API, you know, that can actually be like a way less safe situation because then you or the development team behind it might then miss like a crucial problem in it that someone else might be able to find out. Plus, open source is, is something that I deeply believe in on an ideological level as well. You're making tools that you want to be used by everyone and um, being able to be used by everyone obviously means a lot of things, but one of the things that I think it does mean is also the ability for someone else to look at that code and take some of it and use it and build on it because that's how you, knowledge sharing is better than knowledge siloing. Maybe a slightly more <laughs> ideological rant about software licensing, but obviously this is something that I think about quite a lot. Did you hear about that leak from, I think it was a Google someone. So basically an internal conversation leaked where, uh, where someone at Google says that, that neither OpenAI nor Google is in the position to win the, the AI battle because actually open source will win it. And they list in some articles that were written uh, around this, like it's a senior software engineer actually at Google. I just looked it up. Share a link. Yeah, no, I did see that. I did see this. It's um. That's amazing, isn't it? This is actually a really good point, like a really good uh, illustration of the point that I was making about knowledge sharing, right? Like one of the things that I don't, you know, if people are following the kind of LLM, the large language model, like shit show, that's kind of obviously, you know, the, we have all of the the fake doom stuff. That basically is just like a regulatory trap that obviously people like Elon Musk and um, 
you know, Sam Altman and people are doing, right? It's actually just so making it sure that they're the only ones who can ever work on AI because they're trying to scaremonger. But yeah, what basically happened was uh, months ago now, there was a set of the weights that Facebook uses in one of its machine learning models leaked. And then very, very quickly, you had basically the open source community, loads of people kind of just like banded together and made it like (laughs) way more optimized then you could actually have something where you could train a custom llama model on like consumer hardware in like you know a day or so and it was basically as good as one of these like deeply kept secrets of one of the tech giants right so that's kind of what happened and then this conversation is basically about that where people internally in google facebook realized that um there is no moat moat is kind of used as you know the term of like uh, you know, like a defensive term. But um, yeah, basically, this exactly exemplifies my point. That if you have a team of people working on something in secret, the results will probably not be as good as something that interested people from all around the world who may not work for that company for uh, so many different reasons. And a lot of those reasons obviously rely on the politics of, you know, the countries that these companies are in. It's not that easy to get an American work visa and go and work for Google if you're from like big chunks of the world, right? But there's still incredibly smart, passionate driven people who live there and also maybe just don't want to work for Google because Google are evil, but really care about AI and also care about, oh, how can we make this? How can we decentralize this essentially, which is what they've done They've essentially decentralized it so that you're not having to rely on the open AI instance of chat GPT, which is actually also just mining your data and <laughs> then selling it and farming it, uh, you could build your own chat GPT with, with your own weights, you know, your, like, your own preferences about something. And you could do that on your own computer. And that's like kind of, that's a, a quite a radical decentralization of the use of AI, because then also it kind of removes a lot of the privacy constraints. If I host a model that me and my friends use, that's obviously way nicer uh, on a privacy perspective and a data sharing perspective than everyone just using Google's AI for, you know, Google's instance um, for whatever reason. It was very long-winded. But that was, that's exactly, a, you know, a point, like a, an instance of the point that I was saying before with open source, I think. There's a similar, similar uh, aspect to this, like the Discord server, quote-unquote, versus something that is actually a server on Element that we're hosting ourselves. Uh, the same is true for if you use ChatGPT. You basically have nothing to do with it. You get a box that you can interact with. Uh, you can query it. Yeah, infrastructural and architectural decentralization, right? Which is that a decentralization of power? You don't get like a, a centralization of power from a company or whatever. And um, you know, there's a, there was a great Matthew Green thread on Twitter. He is a I can't remember which university he teaches at, but he is a professor of cryptography there. And he was basically talking about, imagine you, uh, imagine this, the political implications of this as well, right? Imagine that you have an offline mini chat GPT, right? But that you've trained on uh, your own kind of corpus of political ideology or literature or whatever. And then that is available to people completely offline in a kind of a country with like an oppressive government at that point. That's kind of a game changer. So there's massive, massive potential ripple effects from this, which is why we are seeing all of this like completely overblown, unjustified like AI doomsdayerism right now in you know the media. I mean, I, I would say I do definitely agree with you. Let's regulate AI very hard, says the pe- person who develops AI and has a huge head start in it. Yeah, it smells very, very fishy. That's definitely true, and that's that's one of the it's part of the very clear incentive for them. But, you know, with every, any powerful technology, there's obviously that, you know, the similarly powerful downsides could also be listed to the, you just said about li- basically liberating information in a, in, a, in a so far unforeseen way. I think, you know, it's powerful, it, it can be dangerous, but doomsdayism is definitely not warranted here. Yeah. I guess that brings us to the end of this AMA, unless someone has one last question to jam in there. We still have about three minutes to go. Make it a good one. Or if, if Max has any closing words, maybe? No, after my open licensing and AI decentralization rant, I uh, no, I'm kind of spent uh, actually. But I might just be spent as well because of uh, post-conference brain, where you uh, 
have spoken to people for 15 hours and had really interesting conversations. <laughs> Maybe it's just that. Definitely understandable. Hopefully everybody enjoyed this beautiful DevRel AMA. Uh, I definitely did. Thanks for coming on, Max, and uh, let's do it very soon next. Good news, guys. There is a pull-up for this AMA this time around. So handle of our dear Jay, Mr. Pizza Man. We need to DM him because the, because the dispenser bot is still broken. So if you want a pull-up to commemorate your presence in this, uh, in this very prestigious uh, exclusive AMA, then uh, reach out to this guy, and then he will send it to you. There's going to be a community call this Friday, so stay tuned for that. There is a little bit of shuffling around in plans because my original plan for it fell through. So also stay tuned for the announcement and uh, see you on the channels. Who's on the community call next week, this week? I'm not entirely sure yet. There are a few options. I'm still still working on the final one okay. because I had I had a plan, but it fell through this week. So uh, yeah. so I, I, I'm looking for the, the plan B right now. All right. Okay. All right, cool. You can come on, Max. If you if you wanna if you wanna do uh, some more, uh, you know, AI renting. Well, I'm then... taking Friday off. Taking Friday off anyway. I am starting a party on Friday, so I will not be joining the the uh, community call this week. Good excuse. Yeah, exactly. All right. <laughs> Ciao, everyone. Thank you for listening, as always, and the good and the great question. Come talk in Element instead of Discord. <laughs> Join Element, guys. Uh, shameless shilling, and uh, see you on the channels. Bye, everyone.